We're good? Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Two Years Wiser Than the Lenso Experiment, uh, the talk that you don't understand why is at this conference. Um, we're going to try to delve into uh, the little company that we've been running for two years. Um, and I promise you that this talk is not this. So we have not paid for this time slot, um, and we are not going to advertise our company to you for the next hour. Uh, although that might seem like a variation of what would be possible with this talk. Uh, this talk is actually going to be um, a story about cooperatives. So Nolenso is a corporate cooperative, which means that uh, in our case, it's a workers' cooperative. Everyone who is employed at Nolenso uh, is an equal partner in the business. Uh, we're going to talk about teams generally, so whether you work at a cooperative or not, uh, and finding our purpose in life and some like very lofty sort of goals. Um, but mostly this talk is going to be disaster porn. Um, so we're going to set the stage for uh, various stages of growth um, through Nalenso's timeline as a business. Um, we'll start out with A Tale of a Thousand Lunches, which was how Nalenso started out, how we formed the business. Uh, act two, um, if we think of this as a play, is trying not to die, so surviving as a business. Uh, then we're going to try and have a little fun once we stop just surviving and we uh, manage to handle our day to day. And then um, this Act 4 is labeled puberty uh, because of a further theme that's coming up, but essentially um, the growth of the business as though it were a child into adulthood. Oh no, I lost the projector. <laughs> Come back. Um, okay, well, this slide, if it comes back, um, is saying setting the stage with facts. So we're going to try to set the stage factually. Um, and if you don't believe a lot of what I'm saying, although they are primarily facts, um, you can just suspend disbelief for an hour. Sorry, I don't, I don't really have any control over this, I don't think. Um, so as we move on, uh, this talk is going to be pretty fast, so I'm going to have to go through these slides whether you can see them or not. I apologize. Uh, so this slide is the Cosmic Calendar. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen Cosmos, either the uh, sort of sad Neil deGrasse Tyson one or the really good one um, that came out in the 80s. But uh, the Cosmic Calendar represents all of the time in the universe, so we're starting out with like the largest set of facts possible. Right? Um, I really like the Cosmic Calendar because it takes the entirety of time in the universe and condenses it down to two time spans that you can comprehend as a human being. So one is a single year, we've all experienced a single year, and uh, the other is a single second. So humanity on this uh, time scale has lasted for about two seconds. And if you've ever been in a car crash or experienced intense pain, uh, you know that a single second can last for a very long time from your perspective. So if we jump down another notch uh, to humanity, so we say 60,000 to 120,000, give or take, years of human beings on the planet, uh, we're looking at uh, now technology as we've expanded and grown our technological uh, capacity as, as a species um, over time. And it seems to be growing exponentially. Uh, you can look at it in another way, which is that we've had dips, ups and downs. So uh, the Dark Ages in particular definitely seems like a time that we lost some technology and lost some knowledge. Uh, so whichever model you choose to think of, it definitely feels as though we're in an uptick right now. Uh, so what this means for uh, productions um, of the human species at the moment is that we have a lot of ingredients. Uh, so some of these ingredients, for example, are a civilian accessible global positioning system. So it's pretty amazing that we have this. We didn't have this 50 years ago, um, and it enables a lot of things. And we have global 400 kbps to 100 megabits per second uh, wireless networks in urban areas, which is much more recent. This is uh, more like the last five to 10 years, definitely um, the last 10. Prior to that, we didn't have anything like this. And we also have these personal computers in our pocket that are sized bar of soap, and they can talk to all of these networks, which is pretty amazing. So once you have all of these ingredients put together, you get crap like Uber, which is great. Uh, so we have all these startups that are emerging, and they're super handy, right? But nothing about Uber is interesting. It's a Node.js app uh, that runs somewhere in the cloud, and it'll probably be replaced in five years. But all that infrastructure behind it is fascinating and allows us to do some really exciting stuff. Um, so the next fact, we have an increasingly global economy. If you look for, at our economy from 1950 to the present, it's exploding, right? You have to deal with the entire globe. 
you're going to suffer it or you're going to enjoy it one way or the other, but we are a full planet now and you can't really get around that. Global transportation, so it's a similar graph, it's not quite as extreme, but people are moving around a lot. I live in Bangalore, which would have been an impossibility for my father or my mother, uh, certainly in the kind of industry that I'm in. And global communication, so I did have uh, like speeds traveling across the internet um, slide before, but now I think this is a little better. It would have been impossible for this conversation to happen 10 years ago, or it would have happened over email and people couldn't see, but this is Elon Musk and John Carmack discussing uh, rockets around SpaceX and Armadillo airspace over Twitter. And everybody kind of like went crazy over this because this is really, really neat, right? So this is, uh, I'm going to diverge for a second away from facts. Um, I dated a girl in university and she took me to church a few times. I'm not a church goer myself. I, whatever you think of that. Um, and she took me to one church sermon that I actually, um, I really enjoyed, and it stuck with me. Um, and the pastor was saying that if you go back 1,500 years, the king was the only person who could talk to everybody, right? He could send a guy out or a lady out on a horse, and he could cross the countryside on the horse and go talk to this person that he needed to talk to and then he could get the message back. He was also the person who could travel, right? He could travel across the countryside on a similar horse or a wagon or whatever. Um, we are now those kings, is what this pastor was telling us. He's like, you have good food, you have clean water, you have a roof above your head, you can talk to anybody in the world, and you can get anywhere in the world. You are, well, except maybe North Korea, right? But like, the limits that remain are not uh, physical limits, right? So we're all kings. Everybody in this room is privileged like a king. Next fact, violence is ending. So if you want to take a look at this, there's a lot of interesting statistics, and this is probably one of the harder ones to sort of get your head around. Um, but definitely violence over time, over the existence of humanity as a species on the planet, is coming to an end. So this is a good book to look into for that. Poverty is ending, and this one is much easier. And thank you, Amit, for bringing this up earlier. It was actually the exact uh, same video that I'm about to show you here, which is Hans Rosling. Hopefully. Oh, sorry, we need we sound. 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. So Hans Rosling, you should look him up. You should look up gapminder.org because it's really fascinating, right? So this guy basically says, to heck with optimism, that's a waste of time, and that's a bunch of useless emotions. Gather the facts, right? Take the data and plot them, and he plots them in a variety of different ways, and then he's created a Java applet that you can plot the data in your own ways, so you can plot any amount of data across time or across countries or whatever, but this is essentially everybody the world over improving on the poverty scale, right? So if you go outside and you see somebody begging on the street, you think to yourself emotionally like, oh no, poverty, it's a problem. Yes, it's a problem, but it's a problem that we're actually solving, which is kind of counterintuitive. So remember, our intuition is almost always wrong. Gather the data, gather the facts, and then project them into the future to make intelligent anticipation of where you're going. So. If we run the five whys exercise, which is like a boring uh, project manager, business analyst, like the sort of people that don't come to a conference like this, um, exercise on any meaningful business, right? Which is ask why, and then when you get the answer to that question, you ask why again, and then you so forth, so forth five times. Um, you're always going to wind up at Maslow's hierarchy, right? You're always going to wind up at some pers purposeful existence for human beings. Um, that business is fulfilling something to do with that. Right? Otherwise, that business probably shouldn't be there. It's just exploiting the market. Um, and those do exist, but meaningful businesses uh, follow this. So I was told by my colleagues that not everyone knows what the Maslow's hierarchy is. There are other hierarchies. There are other people that have had similar thoughts, but it's all sort of the same thing. Physiological needs are like having a roof over your head, eating food, and then you get to like the fuzzier stuff, and then toward the top, you get self-actualization, or some people even put the tip of this uh, triangle as being... Uh, self-transcendence, which is to become one with the universe or whatever. It doesn't really matter. We're mostly focused on the physiological uh, level at this stage while we're still solving world peace and world hunger because those are things that uh, we need to resolve. So how do we fit in? Sorry, I can't. Speaking too fast? It has to go this fast because otherwise it's not going to get done. Listen carefully. <laughs> um, so 
We are the automators of these businesses. Um, I really do. Uh, am I speaking too fast for anyone to understand what I'm saying? Okay, good, because it really does have to go this fast. I have 160 slides, so deal with it. <laughs> um, so we are the automators of these businesses. As technologists, what we do is we build the infrastructure, the technology underneath the businesses to make them more efficient, to make them more interesting, uh, to give them color, to add data, whatever the case may be, uh, to make them more effective, right? And so what that does in terms of where we are is it puts us right in the center of everybody. I don't know if you, like older guys or ladies in the audience, if you remember the 70s that before this was true, right? Um, so outside of like the Chaiwala near my house, there aren't a lot of people that don't fit into this graph anymore. Software and technology are adjacent to everything else and you can't say that about every other industry, right? You can't, medicine matters, but it's not adjacent to textiles, right? Those businesses don't smash into each other on a regular basis. Whereas if you're software, you get to choose who you're partnering with in the business ecosystem, which is pretty exciting. And that's actually another privilege that we get. So we're already kings and now we get to be extra privileged as software developers or technologists or hardware people or some combination of the both. Um, and I call this the privilege of adjacency. I don't know if it has an actual name, you know, like people who know what they're talking about, academics. Um, the danger of this privilege is the paradox of choice, right? So uh, the paradox of choice is that if you have three kinds of mustard, you can choose the mustard, but if you have 50 kinds of mustard, you can't choose which brand you actually want because there's too many and you're overwhelmed. We should be overwhelmed, right? We can do any kind of software today. We can do any kind of hardware, or at least we're getting there, right? Um, as Uber shows us. So remember, this is kind of a theme of the talk. We are privileged. So we are in this sort of loop of human needs being met by, according to Hans Rosling, uh, statistically speaking, data speaking, uh, the free market, which is fueled by meaningful businesses, which are augmented by technology. So we are hopefully a meaningful business, and we are hopefully building decent technology, right? Um, so here is, as we dive into the story of Nalenso the Cooperative, uh, today's incomplete allegories. Uh, the one we've already touched on is a child growing up, so like being born and then growing into puberty as we saw on the first slide there. Um, another is the evolution of a software project, so we're all familiar with how software has its first commit, how it grows, um, and the last is the evolution of a species. Oh no, okay, well this slide says act one, a tale of a thousand lunches. So this is comparatively in these analogous uh, situations, um, bootstrapping the compiler, uh, it's the first commit to your code base, or if you're a human being, it's your birth, right? So you come into the world, oh no, and the next slide is a video, so this is sad for us, but We'll just, oh, okay, cool. Um, so we'll, we'll just uh, do it with audio. I don't know if anybody remembers, oh, cool. Um, so if anybody remembers the Seinfeld episode where George helps uh, Jerry pitch a show about nothing to NBC? <laughs> so we go into NBC, we tell them I got an idea for a show about nothing. Exactly. They say, what's your show about? I say nothing. There you go. <laughs> I think you may have something here. <laughs> so that was basically us. Uh, we decided we were going to form a company and we weren't sure what it was going to be about. Um, later on, when we chose the name and the name didn't come first, it actually reflected this. So Nalenso is nil, which is like the absence of a value in programming languages. And Enso is actually a word, uh, it comes from Zen primarily, but uh, it's Japanese, uh, for the void or emptiness or infinity or no thing. So Nilenso is effectively nothing, nothing. Um, so this is, if you are this child, this is equivalent to your mother telling you, and everyone's mother tells them this a lot, that you can be anything you want to be. You can be anything. You will grow up and you will take over the world and you'll become a great physician or you'll become a great academic or you'll become an astronaut or whatever, right? But you have to choose something and that's the catch. You can't just be a three-year-old boy or girl your entire life and become an 80-year-old man who's like, I can be anything, but I have two years to do it, right? Uh, so when we started this company, we were in this mode, if we can be anything, and we went to Adiga's, actually, I don't know if anybody knows Vasudev Adiga's, it's delicious. Um, so we would go to Adiga's near our office uh, every day for lunch. Uh, we were working somewhere else at the time. Um, and we were all on the way to being out of work, or we were effectively out of work. So there were eight of us, and we would go to Adiga's, and we'd hold these roundtable discussions. And we would uh, talk to each other and say, like, okay, 
what do we want to be? And we would start yelling over top of each other. So we would take a card and we would literally pass it around the table and everyone would get a turn to talk and then we would write down the ideas. It was quite slow. Uh, and what we started out with was we knew we wanted to build a business. So you can kind of like separate out uh, with set theory um, what we weren't going to be, right? So we weren't going to be a nonprofit. Uh, we weren't going to be some like hippie collective. We wanted to be a company. So we had different models that were uh, available to us, uh, a partnership, we could try a standard equity model. We could do an umbrella thing where everybody was an independent consultant. Uh, we actually talked about something pretty neat. A few people, whoa, sorry, I think that was actually me. Uh, a few people discussed decaying equity or like an equity wedge where when you leave the company, you have equity in the company, but your equity decays over time so that you can't just hold on to a piece of the company forever, like my precious. Um, and then the last is a cooperative, which is what we ended up choosing. Uh, so the definition of a cooperative, I already sort of went over, but a worker's cooperative is where all the workers, all the employees in the cooperative own the business equally, and that's important because people were asking me last night, uh, do people who've been around longer have more ownership of the company or people with more like seniority, blah, no, just it's a lot easier if you just give everyone the same amount of ownership. Alternatively, there's such a thing as a consumer's cooperative where the customers all own a piece of the business equally. We're not one of those. Uh, so what ends up coming out of this that people can't really get their head around is that if everyone owns the company, nobody does. Um, which is a kind of magical thing because you get rid of this emotional tie-up to the company. You're like, me, it's mine, I need this, I own this, I need it to be a success. You still want it to be a success, but differently, right? And the reason that we couldn't do one of those other models is because founders leave, uh, owners who might not be founders, right? They might just people, be people who gave you money. They can get bored, they can exit. Uh, people lose focus, so your employees, uh, your founders can get bored. Um, businesses can sell out, which a lot of people are kind of like gunning for these days. Is like, I want to get rich by turning my business into something that I don't control. Um, that's not winning, in my opinion. Think what you want. Um, and people die, right? So like the absolute highest level of this is uh, the survival rate of everyone drops to zero. Um, over a long enough timeline. And so remember, projection. So you're taking the, the business that you have today and you're projecting it into the future, right? Uh, so these are friends of ours. Uh, friends of ours run a small company called ActiveSphere, which is very similar to Nalenso in a lot of ways. It's like small consultancy. Uh, they do more Node.js, we do more closure, but whatever, doesn't matter. Um, and so they've actually encountered this problem, right? So they've had people leave who were founders, and now I've asked them for permission to use their logo, by the way. Um, so they are looking at other models, and we're like, hey, you could use our model, because it's not so terrible. Um, so cooperatives have these properties, right? They do not decay over time. Your founders, when they leave, it doesn't matter, because they're not special in this spectrum of people that you have working there. Uh, they do not require any fiddly equity paperwork, and if you've ever tried to deal with equity in any company, uh, you'll know that that's a huge relief. They are just a simple entry-exit scheme, right? When people join, they get the same thing that everyone else has, and when they leave, they lose it, right? That's it. Um, cooperatives, therefore, are institutions. Even if it's your first day as a cooperative, you think of an institution as being something like MTR, that has been around forever, well, actually, just 50 years or whatever. But, um, but if you have two people and they own something equally, and then every person that joins owns it equally, and nobody can leave and destroy that thing, it's an institution, right? It's not backed by the people necessarily. Um, so there are some huge cooperatives out there. So the co-op, which is like the least uh, creatively named corporate cooperative on the planet, uh, is a cooperative from where I'm from in Canada. Um, it's really huge. It's actually a federated cooperative, uh, which means that they own subsidiary cooperatives. Um, but everybody, all the consumers own all the cooperative equally. Amul is another cooperative uh, in India, but it is not uh, a corporate cooperative by the definition that we're using here. Uh, so a corporate cooperative is not these things, including at the bottom, the Indian cooperative legal entity, and we'll get there. Um, it's not a union, right? So people always uh, like, want to draw this comparison to unions. It's like, oh, the management and then the workers. It's like, no, those are the same people now in a cooperative. Uh, it's not a kibbutz, so like, it's not like people like, live in the office. Well, Nina did for a couple of weeks, but that was just because he didn't have a house. Um, so it's not communism, it's not a hippie commune, it's not socialism, it's not a special equity structure at all. Nobody has equity in the company. And it's definitely not a nonprofit, which is a 
a weird thing that I have to explain when I go back to Canada. People are like, oh, you work for an NGO in India? I'm like, no, it's a company. Um, so India, unfortunately, does not have corporate cooperatives. Um, so we've chosen an uh, LLP agreement to structure our company, uh, which is a limited liability partnership, which is a new thing. It's been around for about five years to replace the existing partnership structure. Um, Private limited was too restrictive. Uh, to move people in and out of, uh, of the ownership of a private limited is really cumbersome and it has like time restrictions and stuff on it, so we couldn't do that. And the Indian cooperative, like literal cooperative, uh, is not an option for a technology company. It's mostly geared towards agriculture uh, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really work for international business. So Indian cooperatives are mostly like, you grow this rice and then you sell it to other people in India. It's very India focused. Um, and I really hope that that'll change in time because we would totally be a cooperative if we could. Being an LLP is actually kind of a pain in the butt. Um, so lies that we wanted to avoid. Um, so going back to Uber for a second, every driver is a partner. No, they're not. They're a contractor. The word partner means something. It is a literal definition and it is not an Uber driver, right? I don't care if they're making great money, whatever. They are not a partner in that business at all. Zero. That's a lie. We're a collective. If you're a collective, everyone needs to own the business collectively, right? You need some paper definition for that thing. This is your business. Is it? Then give me the paperwork that says that I own the business, right? Or worst off, we're a family. I remember, like, I remember when I first heard that when I worked at a, one of these companies that I used to work at, and the guy was like, oh, we're a family. I'm like, that's incredibly creepy because you are not actually my father and this relationship is... <laughs> Um, so please don't do that with your business. So uh, what we wanted as a company was actually different um, from what a cooperative structure is. Uh, we wanted some extra stuff, right? So we wanted continued education and corporate cooperatives, and I'm guessing Amul as well, uh, promote continued education for all their employees because of course they own the business, they should be smart, they should be doing the right things. Uh, but we also really like open data, open source, and being an open company, at least internally so far. Um, but we had these other things that really have nothing to do with all these ideals, right? We wanted to travel, we wanted to work remotely, we wanted to be distributed. And this is sort of saying like, I'm a king, but I really want to be like a big king, right? Like I want to fly around the world and live in Spain. Um, and that's fine, right? Like we, this was the conversation in Adiga, it's like, what do you guys want? And they were like, we want to live in Spain. And we're like, all right, fine, we'll try and do that. Uh, we don't have anybody living in Spain yet, by the way, right? We all live in Bangalore. Um, and we want to build good technology. So that's sort of like central, uh, access for running the company. Um, what we discovered later is that hiring people is really hard uh, and this is a privilege thing, right? So if you're coming from a great company and then when you leave that company and you're like, I have this resume, who wants to hire me? And everyone wants to hire you, you're privileged. And that's pretty much all of us in this room right now. Um, and it's a different kind of privilege than being able to fly to Spain, right? This is, um, this is personal business. Right? And so a co-op is kind of a cheat because you can say you own part of this business. You can influence this business. You can participate in a democracy. So I encourage you to take some version of that uh, home after today. Um, and this is another thing that we discovered later, and this is where the disaster porn starts, is um, we did not have a solution for ops people when we started out, and we still don't. Right? So our security guard, our secretary, and our cleaning lady uh, are not on our LLP agreement, and we don't really know what to do there. Right? because we're teaching them English, but they don't speak English, so they can't even really sign the LLP agreement. Plus, are they operating in the same capacity as technologists? Uh, we don't really know, right? So it's not like this like, super hippie ideal that people think where it's like everybody is equal the world over. That's not true. Um, so as we come out of this birthing phase and we start to think about our idols and inspiration, right? As a child, you need heroes. So as a child, uh, Roberta Williams might have been your hero, right? She, like, she basically birthed MMORPGs and it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. I want to be her. Or maybe you want to be Liskov, but we're talking about business people and Roberta was a businesswoman. Um, so ThoughtWorks is definitely one inspiration, right? So like ThoughtWorks is, think about their company however you want, but they're interesting to me because they're global. Right? And they're not global out of necessity. They're not working out of Nicaragua because they need oil. They are uh, global by force. They push themselves into other countries because they, they can see this, right? They know business is going to be global inevitably. You might as well start now. 
Um, Semco is an interesting one. If you guys haven't read Maverick, I really encourage you to. It's a fantastic book. Um, so he has a lot of weird things. He really hates nepotism, so he doesn't allow anyone in the company um, to have another family member join the company. It doesn't matter whether they're hiring them or not. He's just like, to avoid nepotism, just no family members are allowed in. And it's like, well, that's kind of like a um, bazooka solution, but it works. Um, so what's interesting about Semco to me is that they are a service-oriented business in the way that we would construct service-oriented architecture in that if they have a department that grows large enough, they actively encourage their employees to leave and go start a business that they can outsource to and they'll have this kind of arrangement where you're a service that we now consume, which is sort of uh, antithetical um, compared to a lot of corporations these days. Um, Buffer is a fairly new one. Um, but Buffer kind of has this like radical transparency thing where you can go to their website and you can see everybody's salaries and their equity breakdown. They do participate in equity, that whole game, but um, they're super transparent, more transparent than us. Um, and 37 Signals for like heralding the bootstrapping revolution, right, if it's a revolution at all. Um, because that was part of our initial plan. As a cooperative, we can't take VC, so we have to bootstrap by definition. Um, and lastly, Tesla for vision, right? So if you look at Tesla, they're quite different from a lot of companies because they're sort of like, we are doing this projection thing. And we're doing it on a 20-year timescale or a 30-year timescale. We anticipate that the market and the industry and the technology is going to go in this direction, and we're going to try and meet them there along the way, which is uh, encouraging. So at the end of the day, we decided we will be a cooperative consultancy for funding startups or something. Um, so we don't really know what we are yet, but we're sort of starting out. And, uh, oh, no. It's my, it's my like, transition slides. So anyway, this one says, act one, try not to die, right? So this is, um, I don't really think there's an analog for being a child because usually your parents will take care of you, um, but we're out on our own. And so this is another slide of the dosa from Adigas. So, uh, oh, there it is. Um, and so referencing uh, this period where we were doing these roundtable discussions and we were having this uh, sort of referendum for every little bit of the discussion about what our business is going to be, you end up getting in this habit of holding referendums, right? And when I tell people, who've, even last night, we were like, oh, we work in a cooperative. And people are like, how do you not just get everybody arguing with everybody all the time? And actually, right off the bat, we did, right? So we started the company with everybody talking all the time and we carried into that. Um, and so uh, we found out that we're not so much um, like the Knights of the Round Table discussing things all the time. We're more like Voltron. I don't know if you guys know Voltron. So uh, Voltron is this cool robot and he's made up of, I don't, Voltron is maybe a he or a she, I'm not actually sure. Um, so he's made up of five robot cats and they are manned by people. Um, so they are also robots and they're kind of like coming together and forming this thing. But we weren't really like that. We weren't really like a super cool robot that flies through space. We were more like this little girl dressed up like a super cool robot that flies through space. And actually she looks pretty badass. So we're probably not like her at all. We're probably more like this dude who's taped some cats to himself and is kind of like flailing around. Um, but probably we're a step worse than that and they're actually kittens, but I didn't have an image for that. Um, so this was our first production release, right? If we're going through the software development life cycle, whatever mode you choose, you have to hit production at some point, right? And our customers were not happy with us. Our software broke. And so this was our plan, and this is why it broke initially. We were like, we'll form a democracy of some kind, and then question mark, and then profit, right? This like old meme. Um, part of the issue here was everybody's their own boss. So uh, with everybody's their own boss, everyone wants to take sabbatical, right? Because that's really fun and cool and like we'll go find ourselves in the woods or whatever. Um, that didn't work. Uh, that actually did real damage to our projects and we still haven't figured this one out, right? It's really tough to run a sustainable business and let people go on sabbaticals even on, on schedule. So we haven't uh, sorted that yet. But the really big one was we started our first experiment. So this was Wiken. So it's open source now. You can go have a look at it. it uh, it's a decent little Rails app, but it was built in, in one month. Uh, it was meant to be this like wiki that we would sell. 
Um, but instead, what it became was poor Tim, who was assigned to work on Wikenso, uh, was just the center of this table, right? So everyone is standing around and we're like, Tim, I have this idea, this greatest idea. Um, but no one else was actually doing any work. Um, and so going back to 37 Signals is an inspiration, right? They, they say this in relation to remote. So people ask them the same questions. How do you do remote? How do you, don't you need to have conversations all the time? And they're like, no. Work is about working. It's not about talking to each other constantly. It's not about making decisions, right? Um, and so we sort of went in a different direction and we instituted an executive, uh, which is basically the suits, right? And so what was the executive for? Well, the executive did these things, right? They made the difficult decisions, such as to kill sabbaticals. Um, they had the difficult conversations. So we had difficult conversations inside about performance. We had difficult conversations outside with our clients, um, hiring people, um, saying, telling people that we won't be hiring them. Um, and then finally, and most probably most importantly, taking this round table of opinion, right? And rather than having everyone sit down constantly and always be talking to each other, try to condense the opinion uh, piecemeal as you speak to people and have these conversations and you try to gauge uh, how much you should be having them. So this is actually, this is interesting, right? We've split ownership. So everyone owns the company equally, but not everyone is participating in the operation of the company equally. So I think people get confused about that often. Um, and so work is mostly about working. That means that mostly those people that were standing around yelling at Tim uh, need to be writing software, right? So we need to spend 80 to 90% of our time doing software development. But there are other things that are not just banging out code and doing billable hours in our case, because we're a consultancy. Um, we needed to come up with a hiring process and a hiring process where people get to become partners in a company is more complicated than hiring processes that I've done elsewhere, right? So uh, that hiring process is staged. Uh, we do three months as a contractor. So you come in, you work as a contractor with us. We might pay you a little extra to like cover the risk that you're taking by being a contractor. And then uh, we hire you as an employee and for three more months, you're an employee. And then after six months, you join as a partner. But that actually gives us a really long time to kind of evaluate each other. You can say, do I like working at this place? And we can say, do we like working with this person? Uh, another one that's more recent was finding a polynomial salary curve. So we tried this in 2014. It didn't really work out. Our polynomial was very jerky. It was not a polynomial. Um, and our polynomial is still not a polynomial. We're, so we're trying to fit everybody into this curve that seems fair and seems smooth and makes sense mathematically, which is harder than you would think. And finding that curve is not about sitting there and discussing what it should look like, right? That was Nid and Deepa sitting in a room with Microsoft Excel for two days and burning their brains out trying to make the math work, right? That's work. Um, and then finding health insurance was another one. So that is going out and investing the different, investigating the different companies and then bringing all that information back to everyone in the company and being like, what kind of health insurance do you want? Will this work for everybody? Um, that's not really so much a conversation until that last point where we sort of finalize the, the decision together for doing it democratically. Um, so, we reversed this, fixed that for you, profit first, which is the 80 to 90% software development. Um, and then we actually have question marks remaining for like, what is the rest of the business, right? So now we have a foundation of, we just want a sustainable business that can move forward. Um, and then we'll do interesting stuff later. Um, so this was in our child analogy, a child garnering their sense of self, right? So who am I? I am this physical entity and we're sort of stumbling forward like Voltron or, or a little girl or whatever. Um, the next step was asking ourselves, what are we actually good at? Um, and we're pretty good at running software projects or reasonably good at it. So why don't we run the software company like a software project? Um, and so Tejas, who's actually in the center of the front row here, um, he, he wanted the credit for this, and I'm happy to give it to him. Um, so he created these hideous graphs, right? But they're amazing. They're really fantastic. So he's laid out uh, our cash flow, our um, incoming invoices, our sales leads, which at the time of this graph were not particularly good, um, at the bottom there. And he's done this all with a script, right? So that we can run this once a week and just shove in everybody's faces. Um, our profit or our lack thereof, because that's your sustainability, right? That number one, if you don't have profit, your business goes away and then you don't get to do all the other fun things of being cool Voltron together. Um, so then the next thing that we did, and this is a much more recent development, 
is to take uh, our strategy for a software project, right? So everybody's strategy for a software project is more or less the same, I hope, which is this sort of ordered thing of one, two, three, eliminate processes as much as possible, uh, and then uh, take those processes and automate them with software if we can, or automate them some other way, or worse, but still functional, outsource them, or at least document them, right? And so this is our attempt to say everything about our business uh, we are going to document, and then if we can, we'll automate it with something behind that. But this is your entry point. If you want to know how to take a vacation, if you want to know how to take a sabbatical if we ever get there, if you want to know how to file for health insurance, it should all be on here, right? This should be the one place that you go for all the information about the company, including every everybody's salaries and all of our finances and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so going back to uh, disaster porn and mentioning running software projects. So this was, uh, this was not our best software development project. Um, this was us trying too hard. Uh, and so we picked up a client that was particularly bad. They had a lead developer in the US who was mildly racist to the guys on the team all the time. Not all the time, but frequently. Um, they didn't have any sort of project management. They didn't know how to run a software project at all. So that was left to us. Um, and then the last straw was, it should have really, but the last straw really should have been the racism, but we weren't um, thinking clearly. The last straw was finally where they brought in a project, project manager um, who told us that you guys need to work this weekend. It's like, this is an arbitrary, like there's no reason to work the weekend. Um, and we fought back eventually, but we, we made the mistake of trying to make this work. Right? And I think that if you're running your own business, which I had never really done before, not seriously, um, it's tempting to make this mistake. Right? Uh, things are looking like they're dying and you want to save them. You want to pull them back from the brink and you try really hard to do that. But sometimes if you're gardening, you let the brown things just like turn into compost right? and you tend to your other plants. So this is the first lesson. If it needs to die, let it die. Um, so at this point, um, that sort of divergence, that was just like one really bad thing that uh, happened with us, which is sort of a data point for us, not necessarily always knowing how a software project should work. Um, this was our first look uh, in the mirror, was fairly shortly after this, um, where it actually came out of an internal argument. So the internal argument was we'd mostly decided on us being a cooperative, and this was like more or less the structure that we were going to do. Um, and somebody disagreed with that vehemently um, in the midst of actually a project that we were working on. And so I, drew, I doodled this on a whiteboard. This isn't the original drawing, but it looked something like this, um, which is our foundation is the cooperative. And then on top of that, we have some democratic something, right? At the time, it was an executive, uh, but it's whatever. And then on top of that, we have a revenue stream, which is consulting. And we can replace that. For some reason, by the time I finished drawing this, it looked like a layer cake, so I put candles on it. Um, the candles are experiments that we run. And what this represents is how quickly things change with time. So uh, the stuff at the bottom changes slowly, and the stuff at the top changes maybe daily if it has to. Really quickly, it can be volatile, so the candles are volatile. This is a terrible diagram, um, but it conveyed the intent. And then Nina came up with this, so he was like, it's not really like a cake, because a cake doesn't change with time other than getting consumed. So it's more like a planet, where the core is this nothing, nothing thing, and then outside of that, we have the notion of the cooperative. And then outside of that, we have some sort of structured democracy. And then outside of that, we have our primary revenue stream, which for the time being is consulting, but maybe we'll build a product and make it rich or whatever, and it'll replace the, uh, the crust on the Earth's surface there. And then the trees are the experiments. And they become bedrock when they die, which is kind of backwards, but I mean, all these diagrams are going to be kind of broken. And Tim noticed the other day that actually our planet diagram is very similar to this unpublished Dilbert cartoon, um, which is somewhat embarrassing. And this is the danger of coming up with imagery or coming up with slogans or coming up with a mission statement, right? Is that as soon as you do that, you embed something in your culture that maybe you don't want. And so what we do want is a constitution. Uh, we want something that's legally binding and defines our company uh, in terms of lawyers, right? Which is a weird thing to say. But um, so a constitution is great, and we effectively had one that we'd verbally agreed on. We're going to be this cooperative and blah, 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 right? It 
down, right? You need to take this constitution and you need to legally embed it. And we started out uh, with sort of a constitution, but we did it backwards. So we took an LLP agreement from our lawyers, but we just took a vanilla one. And we were like, we'll just fix this later, right? Like, I'll just, I'll just do this hack now and like, I'll fix it tomorrow. I'm tired, I haven't had enough coffee. Um, we screwed that up royally. This has actually really, really hurt us. So this has been two years in the correcting to get this LLP agreement back to where it needs to be. So take your constitutional ideas and write them down as best you can. They won't be perfect, um, but if you're starting a company, you want that right off the bat. And if you happen to want to be a cooperative, uh, please wait. We will, once we have this LLP agreement ratified, that's been, it's two years in the process, but it should be done by August, September. Uh, once all the changes are through, we will open source this actually. So because there's no such thing as a corporate cooperative in India, this is an alternative. You can use this document as a template and you could come up with your own, should you choose. Um, so at this point, we had some ideological exits. Um, so these ideological exits were people uh, who, how am I doing on time actually? 15 minutes, okay. Uh, so these were people who came in and they were in the nothing, nothing phase and they're like, we want it to be just about anything, right? Um, and what we chose was this cooperative and they left. And what you need to learn from that and what we needed to learn from that uh, is to be okay with exits, right? So this is really tough. You have to be okay with leaving the company. Tay just left the company recently and it's like sad for people, right? But you have to get over it because people move on. Um, people find other things to do, right? And it's okay. Um, and so the truth is that our core, this nothing, nothing thing, it does change with the company, um, but slowly, right? Um, and so in the analogy of an evolution of a species, this is uh, possibly a flawed mu mutation is one of these ideas coming up and then not blossoming, or possibly it's a new species and that's what your company becomes. So the Lenso itself, from the very beginning, this nothing, nothing notion, it was an experiment. Um, and what we've tried to capture is an experiment culture. So um, some of us like to think of this as test-driven business. So you set up the test and then we try to come out with a positive outcome from that. Um, this is just like basic science, right? Hypothesize something and then you try it and then you get the data and then you figure out whether or not you were right. And that's because we're all wrong about everything all the time, basically. So running a business is not like being a London cab driver. Being a London cab driver, uh, your hippocampus actually changes shape and you remodel your brain physically uh, to deal with all the streets in London because their test, it's called the knowledge, um, is very intense. Uh, running a business is more like this. You have the Google Maps directions to somewhere, and if you get off of those directions, you might be screwed, right? Unless you know what those streets are, like the back of your hand, like a London cab driver, uh, you're not gonna do very well if your GPS, GPS conks out. And so this is what we are, so we have to use experimentation to find our way through. Um, so we have a few of these going on right now. Kulu.in is a product that we're trying. Uh, we've tried to take external equity in other companies, actually. So that's another experiment we've tried. And we have a design practice going on, which is sort of an addendum to uh, software development. But most of anyone's data is not gathered by way of intentional experiment, right? You are not running explicit experiments all the time as a human being to figure things out. You're mostly observing stuff. Right? So you're looking at things and you're trying to gather the data as you go along and if you notice that something is messed up, you will try to correct. And so that's actually most of what we've been doing as a business is when we recognize that something is broken, then we'll try to extract an experiment out of that and run that intentionally. But we are not uh, running experiments all the time for every little piece of the business. Um, so once we got past all of this kind of uh, disaster stuff, we started to have a little bit of fun. I'll go through these really quickly. The success stories of Nalenso or anywhere are the boring ones, right? So we switched from writing a lot of Ruby to writing a lot of Clojure. We started writing services that had really like tight uh, performance requirements. We threw out a few MVPs, uh, some profitable services, and Abhinav started teaching Haskell classes in the office, which I don't know if that's gonna become a formalized thing that you guys can sign up for or not, but they're pretty fun. Um, and what we discovered is this number two slot, right, is, and it was sort of implied in the beginning, but that we love technology. So that is sort of the core of the business is we're a technology business. We don't necessarily know what else it might become. Number three is still a question mark. Um, and this seems obvious when I describe it, right? But it's not. 
Um, you can make a software company, you could be Mapbox, right? So those guys love maps, and they might love maps more than software. And so you might like any of these other things, and you might be really excited about those, and you might build your business on top of those. So you might not be technology at your core. Um, this caused another exit for us, actually. Uh, we always had this conversation about we can be anything, we can be anything, and our canonical example was we could be a cafe. Like, we could be this cool bicycle cafe where we like serve good coffee in Bangalore because it's like it's easy to get decent filter coffee but it's not easy to get decent Italian coffee so we were like yeah we'll like start this cafe and it'll be really cool and we had a guy leave because we didn't get there in two years right he's like I wanted something else right I just didn't want to be building software forever and ever and that's sad but you have to be okay with it right so this is really important and it's, it's amazing uh, how recurrent a theme this is that you need to be okay with people leaving your company and it's important to be gentle, right, in all cases. So it's not like he was fired or anything, but in the full spectrum from being fired to leaving of your own volition, people have huge emotional responses to leaving a company, and he was really sad. And so it's important to be gentle with him and tell him that, hey, it's okay, man. Like, if you want to go do something else, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to go be a farmer, then good. Like, more power to you, right? Um, and what I would say, especially in his case, but other people... Uh, that I've known since I've moved to Bangalore in the past three years is um, this term that I've come up with uh, to try to contrast the rock star programmer imagery, which is gentle nerds, which is people who just like work really hard and think really deeply and often are very philosophical or very mysterious. And uh, I don't understand them, but I can identify them. Right? And I am definitely not one of these people. <laughs> but if you start to see them in the crowd and they're often very young, uh, you should pick them up. Um, and so what we got to um, in terms of a place of where we needed to be was uh, fully autonomous, right? So trying to find autonomy is difficult, and this is analogous to a child growing up to be eight or nine years old, and they're taking a BMTC bus across the city for the first time without uh, my mom, you know, and I'm scared. Um, and the reason for this, the reason for autonomy is because we went too far with the suit thing, right? The pendulum is swinging from referendums over here to people making unilateral decisions over here. And I definitely know that I was part of some of those unilateral decisions on this side. Um, comparatively, you could swing the pendulum back, right? So we did a, a construct crawl um, a few months back. And there was a Swiss fellow that gave us a suggestion. He was like, oh, you could write an iPhone and Android app and you could have any time a decision point comes up, everyone could get the decision broadcast to them and they could vote on it. Um, that's really scary, right? Because we are not a hive mind. I don't know if anybody's ever seen Zardoz, um, but this is what they do. So they're telepaths and they like vote on every single conceivable decision together. That's not better, right? That's just going back to referendums. So this uh, is a game called uh, Little Big Planet, and this is a little more representative, perhaps, than Voltron in terms of what things started to look like over time, right? So the way Little Big Planet works is uh, no one can get left behind, behind and nobody can die. So this is a cooperative game where you have to just forcibly push your way to the front and figure things out and cooperate uh, to be kind of a team together. Um, and that's sort of what autonomy looks like, right? You're constantly picking someone up and throwing them ahead. And the structure for autonomy is to throw people in the deep end, but not to let them drown, right? So if people are uncomfortable taking sales calls, first they shadow on the sales call. So you take the sales call and they listen in, right? Or they maybe chime in a little bit. And then the next time, if they're comfortable, you have them drive the sales call, right? So they get on the call, they engage the conversation, but you're there to help them along and you help them out until they're comfortable and then they're autonomous and then they take sales calls on their own. And this takes forever. <laughs> like, this took us two years to get to a point where even a few people have started to like, really engage autonomously. Um, so don't expect this to be overnight and I don't have a concrete event-driven story for you guys there. But the lesson is to persevere and even to be relentless. You have to be kind of insane with pushing people into positions that they're not comfortable with if you want uh, this, this sort of operation in your company. Um, and the risk to this, of course, is not that these people are gonna fail. 
So you put somebody in an uncomfortable position, they might fail, right? It, it happens. Um, but your business isn't going to be a disaster. The risk is self-flagellation. That person is going to be really hard on themselves. If you remember the first time you picked up a musical instrument or drove a car or tried to write your first program, you were really hard on yourself, right? Or at least I was, because you aren't comfortable with this activity yet. And so you have to be, again, really gentle with everybody when you put them in these positions. Um, it's worth noting that despite getting to a relatively autonomous state, um, where people are mostly making decisions on their own and you don't have to check in with everybody all the time, we still can't decide where to go for lunch on Fridays. So these kind of like global decision-making processes are still difficult. Um, there are bonus points uh, for autonomy, and this is network resilience. Right, so running a company I find is actually a lot like software. So if I am in the center there and I'm making a lot of connections, but I'm not providing those connections to other people, if I'm not hooking people up uh, with people that may potentially hire them away, right, or um, might, they might say something silly to, if I consider myself this important connector, if I leave the company or I die, <laughs> then we lose all this contact with these clients, right? Um, so what's better is if I can push people, let's say it's me, it's probably not me, but if I'm in that uh, central position, if I can push people to be connected to the clients, to say the accountant or the lawyer, or whoever your business is dealing with, and each other, right, when I die or when I go find a better job, be I go join Flipkart, whatever, um, these connections are, are not lost, right? So the, the um, resilience of the network is still there. Um, it's weakened for sure, but now you can go around and you can start to fix these connections without me, right? Somebody else can start to take the lead. Um, this is also an entry exit bonus. So again, when you think uh, of people joining and leaving your company, um, people often think about the risk of the exit, right? Like, oh, somebody's gonna leave, like, oh my God, it would be terrible if this person left the company. It's like, well, maybe, right? It might be terrible, but there's also this possibility that they're going to bring something new, right? They're going to tell people about your company. They're gonna tell you guys in the company about this neat new thing that they're doing, and maybe it's not even software development. Maybe they did go be a farmer, and maybe you wanna be a farmer, and you're gonna find this out, right? And so trusting people is the antidote to this fear. You have to trust everybody that even if they do something that you don't like, that they're doing the best that they can. Um, and so a more recent challenge, uh, and this is like the last piece of disaster porn, and this is um, uh, from within the last nine months or so, uh, was we hired a business person, an actual business person, because it was all software developers running a company like a software project, mostly. Um, and she came in and she plotted our finances and said, hey, <laughs> did you guys know you've been cash negative for six months? Uh, hi, Deepa, if you're watching this from, I don't know if this is being live, broad, live broadcast, if she's watching from the office. Um, so she plotted our finances and we actually did not so great. Uh, this was like nine, 10 months ago, but it was like for a six month period where we were sending people to the US for conferences and we were trying to get people educated. Uh, we made these mistakes. Right? We were hiring contractors who came in to teach people, which was part of our MO, right? Where we were like, education is important for everybody in the company. So for ops people, it's teaching them English and teaching them to use computers. For us, it's learning new programming languages and learning new paradigms. Um, the contractors were coming in to like help us with closure and to help us with project management. Um, we also underestimated our salary spend, so we're there we were just trying to be fair. Um, and we sponsored too many conferences in 2015, which was about sending people out for education. So our fault, uh, and we actually forgot our own rule, right? If we had Tejas's graphs at that point, we would have been okay, because we would have noticed like, oh, this seems to be dipping a lot. Um, so we fixed this since uh, by dialing back, back expenses and things, just in case you were concerned about Noenso's finances for some reason. Um, the lesson here is to know your limitations, right? So um, we were essentially running the business uh, for two years without a competent person at the helm, a business person at the helm. And so even two years later, or like almost two years later, when Deepa joined, we were still this guy, right? We were still like not super robotic, not super sexy. We were still figuring ourselves out. Um, and so that takes us to puberty, right? Which is our third year. So as Nalenso gets into its third year, uh, we're figuring out this third thing. So we know that we need profit to stay alive and that we need that more than anything. So we need to pay, people, pay people's uh, paychecks and stuff. And we know that we love technology, um, but we don't really know what the future of the business looks like. So this is kind of abstract, right? This isn't really like a direction to take. And so figuring out 
who am I as a child or as a teenager? Who, what is my purpose? This is maybe more of an adult question. Uh, I'll let Louis C.K. answer this one really briefly. People get it all knotted up. I don't know what to do with my life. Like, I don't know like, what I should be, or like, I don't know. It's like, what should I like do with my, with, like, my life? Just get food, put it in the, put food in here. That's it, put food in here. Walk around and look for food. And anytime you see any food, put it in here. Just take it and put it in here. So he's being facetious, right? Um, but that's a great lesson to remember. So we are these privileged kings, and we're giving ourselves more privilege. So it's like, we've built a software company, and now we love technology, and we're doing closure, and we're doing these fun things, and you guys are doing interesting things as well. Remember, like, everybody's in this position of... Thanks. Um, everybody's in this position of privilege. This is the last slide. Um, and what becomes tempting is to say, like, oh, all that stuff is easy. Right? Paying people's paychecks is easy. And we're like, we'll just don't stop worrying about that and we'll stop fantasizing about the future of the business and what we're going to become and we're going to become this great thing and we're going to solve world problems. We're going to be the next Tesla. And the important thing is to match uh, fantasy with reality and measure the delta. Right? So like, know where you are today and know that that's what's true and think about what you want to be and fantasize about it all you want, right? But don't pretend that you're that thing. Um, and so this is a very important thing for us to keep in mind and uh, to remember. Um, and I think that it's an important thing for all of us who are in these privileged positions to remember. Um, if you want to see some of the initial things, uh, the resources are here and the slide deck is here so you can get all those links. Um, if you want to shout at us, uh, if you have any questions about the dumb way we're running our business, uh, you can talk to either my Twitter account or our Twitter account. You can ask questions in the next three minutes, or I guess I'll be outside and I can answer questions as well. Questions? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know, maybe 150. I'm not sure. A lot. <laughs> This is the first. <laughs> a construct Hi. crawl, we had like 50 questions. Hi. Hi, Steve. This is Vasundar. Uh, I'm really excited about the way you're uh, functioning and you're experimenting with the organization because at the end of the day. Uh, Hi, Tejas. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a very good friend of mine for the past 10 years or so. Uh, uh, he, he instantly. Uh, uh, kind of uh, favored uh, my mention of you, which basically says how much love uh, your ex-partners have for the company and that love will take you uh, a lot, lot in the future. Okay, uh, so what is the, I mean, when, when everybody is a partner, what are all the kind of difficult decisions you had to take? Um, so, uh, one difficult decision, so I, I'm assuming you're referring to possibly the uh, like positioning an executive to make difficult decisions slide. Um, so we actually had an exit which was about performance. Um, so that's a difficult decision and it's a difficult conversation to have. So you can't have eight people or 12 people or however large we are now, you can't have a dozen people have a conversation with one person and be like, by the way, things haven't really been working out, that needs to be one-on-one -on -one, and you need to have someone with the experience to deliver that message and then to have the conversation and to go back and forth. Um, so that's definitely a really difficult conversation that we've had. Um, the conversations with clients haven't been as difficult, right? Um, but another maybe more serious conversation would be the conversation with the lawyers. Uh, so we've hired Ketan and Co. to look at our LLP agreement for a really long time and they have this thread of continuity and so we need someone who we can trust to carry on that conversation intelligently and remember all the details and take notes and all that sort of thing. So that's a, another difficult thing that you need to put someone in that position to own that, uh, that responsibility. So that's actually been Nid and Deepa have done a great and job. And one follow up question is how do you preserve this culture and what, what uh, measures are you taking while hiring or uh, at the time of uh, 
Uh, so, so that's a super tough one. Um, so there's this, the way that I visualize it, and I think everyone visualizes this really differently, right? Uh, I see it as being a spectrum of uh, monoculture, which is dangerous, and being so heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous um, that you kind of explode, right? So like you could hire people that are way out of band. So you could hire someone who's a racist, or you could hire somebody who doesn't know how to program, um, but that's probably a bad idea. And then getting too close to this is probably also a bad idea. So it's this thing of like finding the bubble boundary of homogeneity and sort of pushing a little past that, but probably not being too exploratory, right? Like we're already pretty diverse. We have like half a dozen religions in the office and we have a lot of different ideals. Um, so it's not, I don't think that we're really in the danger of being homogenous, but I don't think there's an easy answer to that question either. <laughs>